Right Honorable Prime Minister Oli, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege and my honor to be here today uh, to share some thoughts about reimagining connectivity. I'd like to uh, organize my thoughts and my comments around three questions. The first question is, just how important is it to reimagine connectivity? The second question is, which country is well positioned to navigate and provide guidance on confronting these profound changes and why? And then finally, what types of organizations are needed to help countries and societies respond effectively to the challenges and opportunities presented by a proper understanding of connectivity? We're all here today because we believe connectivity is important. Phrases like seismic, once in a generation, are invoked to describe the magnitude of the importance of connectivity. However, I would suggest that even these terms underestimate the significance of the changes we are experiencing. Connectivity, which includes artificial intelligence, is changing power dynamics in every sphere of society. Just as the Enlightenment obliterated every existing institution in the West, changes unleashed by the connectivity revolution are doing the same across the globe today. Some of the responses we're seeing to this disruption includes the rise of quote unquote strongman populist leaders and whether or not this is an effective political response still remains to be seen. It is also important to recognize that connectivity is not only a force for creative destruction at the level of national and global institutions, but it's also a double-edged sword regarding the daily lives of people throughout the world. It has brought us unimaginable advances and conveniences ranging from jet travel to instantaneous and free communication with anyone in the world. But it has also made the spread of diseases a global threat, as we are seeing with the 2019 NCOV. These threats also include cyber attacks, new threats to sovereignty, and other dangers. As Tom Friedman, the New York Times columnist, said, during the nuclear age, a handful of countries could kill us all. In this emerging age, any one of us can kill us all. As such, we are at a historic time in the story of mankind, and finding the right way forward has never been more important. Turning to my second question, uh, given that I'm a senior research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization, you might not be surprised at my answer that I suggest that China has much to offer in navigating our way through this historic period, and I have several reasons uh, for this claim. First, the structure of China's government promotes flexibility and agility in responding to domestic and international challenges. We're all following the news, I'm sure, about uh, the containment, the efforts at containing uh, the NCOV virus, including the building of a hospital in 10 days, a thousand bed hospital in 10 days, some of the other measures taken that demonstrate the ability of the Chinese government to act decisively with agility and with flexibility to threats. But given that this is a, uh, a conference, a conclave about connectivity, I'd also like to share a brief anecdote about the rollout of 5G in China. So one of the key challenges of rolling out 5G is not in the 5G handsets, so the, the, the new smartphones that will allow us to download movies in two seconds, but it's really the parts that most consumers don't see, and those are, that's the networking equipment, uh, the base stations, the antennas. And one of the big challenges uh, in rolling out universal 5G really isn't technological, and it really isn't cost. It's the ability to drive change through society. So when we think about putting up three, five, ten times the number of antennas required under 4G, the ability to make things happen at a local, even a neighborhood level is critical. And I think this example, we can see that in where China can make a decision 
at the national level, have it rolled out to the provincial, the municipal, even to the neighborhood level, demonstrates the flexibility that it can bring to addressing not just domestic challenges, but also international ones. Second, the articulation of a vision for international relations uh, that China has uh, articulated and promulgated. And here I would uh, differ a little bit with uh, what Bruno said in his very uh, enlightening and insightful presentation, in that China's vision is creating a community for shared future for mankind. And here the key word is shared future not shared values, meaning that China's view of this world, whether we're talking about the Belt and Road Initiative, whether we're talking about other types of initiatives, uh, the AIIB, uh, other institutions, other types of bilateral and multilateral uh, relationships, are that it's not necessary for us to share the same values, the same ways of looking at the world. It's just enough that we are committed to working together to building a shared future. Finally, uh, I think China has demonstrated a commitment to this vision that is both pra is pragmatic and not dogmatic and demonstrates a long-term perspective. And I'll share two stories with you about this. So a couple of months ago, I was in a coffee shop and had the chance to speak with some high school students and ask them what their plans were. So they said, this was in Beijing, and they said, well, we're going to Hungary uh, very soon. I said, oh, what are you gonna do in Hungary? They said, we're studying Hungarian. And I said, oh, that's very interesting. And they said, yeah, the reason we're studying Hungarian is if we major in Hungarian, we're guaranteed admission to one of the top universities in China. So some of you may know about the incredibly competitive Gaokao uh, examination in China. So this creates a lot of stress for students and parents, uh, very, very competitive. So by offering an alternative track for students, uh, this creates enormous incentives and interest for Chinese high school students to study languages uh, like Hungarian, like Finnish, like Portuguese. Um, with the proviso that they also commit to working for the foreign ministry after they graduate. So uh, one example of a very long-term perspective in thinking about global engagement. The second one, and we could consider this offline diplomacy, the second uh, I would put under online diplomacy. So if you are on Twitter, you've probably noticed uh, the explosion in Chinese ambassadors uh, active on Twitter. And it all started with a gentleman named uh, Zhao Lijian, who was the deputy counsel uh, a diplomat in Pakistan who started tweeting. Currently has 235,000 followers on Twitter. Um, and I think this shows a very, again, very flexible, very pragmatic approach for China to increase uh, its ability to participate in and shape the global dialogue and the global narrative uh, about China and issues that I think is important to China and the rest of the world. And in my role at CGTN, China Global Television Network, I'm also uh, involved in sharing the story of China to audiences around the world. And I've also been involved in Western media organizations in China, including the Foreign Correspondents Club uh, of China. So I've had the opportunity to observe this evolution of the interplay and the interaction between Chinese media and Western media. And it makes me think of a quote attributed to Gandhi, which is that in the beginning, uh, Chinese media was ignored, and then uh, now we see it, it has evolved. But what Gandhi said, uh, was that first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And I see this, uh, this dynamic playing out as more and more uh, Western media sees Chinese media as threatening, uh, as propaganda, so we're in this third phase. Um, whether we ultimately end up winning, whatever that might mean. But uh, that this evolution is also, I think, a sign of China's commitment to participating globally. 
So finally, um, there are many difficult and even vexing problems that need to be defined, analyzed, and solved. And while countries and multinational organizations like the UN, the WTO, and others are necessary on their own, they're not enough. Think tanks also have a crucial role to play. As the policy challenges facing governments and society become increasingly complex, think tanks are uniquely qualified to frame and conceptualize solutions. Thomas Edison said, 5% of the people think, 10% of the people think they think, and the other 85% would rather die than think. Think tanks are populated by people who are predisposed towards thinking. Moreover, the best think tanks are multidisciplinary, which means that they are more likely to achieve breakthroughs in insight and creative policy recommendations. Asian think tanks, in particular, have a key role to play. The diversity of the region, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and its growing economic importance, um, as we all have observed the economic center of gravity is moving eastward, uh, means that there's more and more activity, more and more uh, new developments happening here uh, that are not only require uh, sound analysis, but also provide the input for that analysis. Finally, Asia historically has had a veneration for education and expertise, and I think that also contributes to a very strong uh, think tank industry, if we can call it that. The other kind of organization that is needed are conclaves like the Cantapur Conclave, uh, taking places in places like Nepal, as Bruno mentioned, the importance of countries that are at the crossroads, at the nexus of trade flows, investment flows, neighbor flows, so Singapore, Nepal, other places like that are very, very important. And the people that come here are not only people who think, but also do, and perhaps most importantly, share. So these are the two types of organizations that I believe are vital to addressing this uh, era that we are emerging, not just a generational change, but a change in era. So to sum up, I believe that this idea of imagining connectivity is far more important than just a technological shift, but is profoundly changing every sphere of society and upsetting uh, the power dynamics and creating the opportunities for the creation of new dynamics. I think that China, through its system of governance that allows it to react with agility and flexibility, coupled with a inclusive vision for working with countries around the world, whether that's large countries like the United States, like Russia, as well as other countries like Nepal, like Vietnam, like Ethiopia, like Kenya, uh, really has something valuable to offer. But any country, however well equipped to play a role in this uh, new era is not enough, but we also need to pay attention to organizations like think tanks, like events slash organizations like the Cantapur Conclave. Thank you very much.